It's an uneasy feeling to take up the mantle of the Garen oration. Unlike many who've delivered this oration in the past, I didn't know Robert Garen. He died long before I was born, and yet he has shaped much of my world. I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth he helped architect. I live as I did as a child in the city he helped build. And I work at a university he helped imagine and then see established. I did once briefly work in the public service that he helped create, but I was younger then and should be forgiven that trespass. And of course, my predecessors in this oration span the highest levels of Australian politics, government, industry, and the judiciary, and all of them had something weighty to say about the future and about the unique role that the public service has to play in delivering it. In this, the 2021 Garen oration, I too want to talk about the future and how we might approach it as citizens and as public servants. But to be clear, although I'm sometimes called a futurist, this isn't a series of predictions or assertions about particular futures. Rather, this oration is a meditation on the shape of the future and the tools and approaches we might need to cultivate in order to succeed in it. It's safe to say my take on the future owes as much to my training as an anthropologist and the time I've spent in and around large multinational technology companies in American Silicon Valley. For all its many faults, including a sometimes almost willful denial of the past, I have come to appreciate the American orientation to the future as a space of reinvention and possibility. However, I've also come to believe that this space of possibility must be approached deliberately and with purpose. I've come to think that approaching the future requires two simultaneous actions. First, one must seek to tell stories about the future, stories that motivate and inspire and challenge, stories connected to the present and the past, while offering a different pathway forward. And at the same time, one must actively disrupt the present to make those futures more than just stories. Put another way, we have to invest in the tools and the conversations of the present as much as we do of those in the future. In the final moments of the second year of a global pandemic, we stand in a curious moment. There is hope, certainly, about life after COVID-19 and often wishful thinking. But sometimes it can just feel like the future's on hold, out of focus, distant. After all, during the pandemic, the passage of time hasn't followed familiar lines. Seasons have unfolded, and still, for many, it has felt like the same day has repeated over and over again. That said, COVID-19 is no longer entirely unknowable or unknown. It's touched all of us and shaped and reshaped our bodies, our homes, our families, our daily lives, our communities, our schools, our companies, our cities, and even our governments. It has impacted our ideas about data and privacy, borders, danger, vaccinations, and even public health officials. And whilst the headlines might be the same, the lived experience of COVID globally are multiple and varied. Here in Australia, we've endured a patchwork of lockdowns, restrictions, and border closures, as well as a protracted period of virus suppression, sustained social and economic safety nets, and even now, as we report belated but enviable vaccination rates, not everyone feels safe or unencumbered. Exactly how things will unfold in the months and years to come are harder to ascertain, notwithstanding our assertions of a post-COVID new normal. We have done much in our various presence to ensure that there is a post-COVID-19 future. We've invested in vaccines, healthcare workers, civic society, social systems, and government policy. And the lessons we could draw from this period might help inform public policy, regulation, and standards, as well as future state, national, and private investments in everything from infrastructure to training. Yet, despite the rhetoric from politicians and businesses alike, there is a lack of clarity about what a post-pandemic future could or should be, or perhaps more precisely, there is an unwillingness to contemplate a different future than the one we were headed towards before the pandemic. In my mind, we have an opportunity in this particular moment to do more, to get beyond the catchy taglines and predictions about our future, and instead to develop a coherent point of view about the future and about how we might want to approach it. The future of work, the future of the office, the home of the future, the city of the future, future thinking, future state, future generations, future directions, Speculative futures, dystopian futures, prospective futures, future risk, future shock, future challenges, future proof, a better future, an uncertain future, securing the future, back to the future, facing the future, jobs of the future, save our future, in the future, the future, our future. There are lots of ways the future is evoked in government, politics, business, movies, and even music. What are we talking about when we talk about the future? Is it a place, a promise, a prediction, a warning, 
a moment in time, an aspiration, a hope deferred or a promise made and never fulfilled? And who gets to talk about the future anyway, to predict its path, advocate its particular unfolding, or even plan for its arrival? In Western Europe, at least, the idea of the future as a point in time not yet arrived at dates back to the Middle Ages. Then it was closely allied to the notion of transformation, of an individual becoming anew in an almost ecclesiastical sense. The idea of the future as a destination, or a changed state, or an active way of being is a much more recent adaptation. This later orientation, especially as it implicates whole groups and societies, appears to emerge in the 20th century. Some have argued this sort of future is the product of the modern age and its fascination with speed, change and reinvention. Or more bleakly, as one Australian futurist put it, the future becomes an arena of economic conquest and time becomes the most recent dimension to colonise, institutionalise and domesticate. For some, the future is less a space of conquest and more a promise that never needs to be delivered upon. I've written elsewhere about this notion of the proximate future. The proximate future is a future indefinitely postponed, when we are continually about to enter a new age, when we are continually anticipating what comes next, and when our intention is continually directed over the horizon and away from the seemingly unsolvable challenges of the present to a better future. This is a far cry from the way Australia's First Nations people might talk about and conceptualise the future. Always was and always will be offers a through line from the past to the present to the future and makes clear both persistence and responsibility. Of course, there are others who worry less about how to conceive of the future and occupy themselves with working out how to own the future. In this formulation, the future waits for the person with the best story to unlock its value or to be better prepared for its unfolding. Indeed, we've always had people who told stories about the future in attempts to lay claim to it. Sometimes they charted the flights of birds to foretell specific events. Sometimes they divined meaning in the entrails of animals or the ripples of a bowl of water or the fall of tea leaves. Sometimes they published models about capital markets or populations. Sometimes they predicted coming trends in colours, food and music. Sometimes they stood on stages and delivered expansive visions of future products. Sometimes they spoke of revolution or change. Sometimes they demanded constancy and a return to older orders. And sometimes they wrote novels and screenplays about a future that would, recursively, haunt our imaginations and shape the way we approach that very same future. William Gibson lives in that last category. Gibson writes speculative fiction, and over the years he has helped frame the ways in which we encounter new digital technologies. His works Burning Chrome and New Romance are widely credited with firmly lodging the term cyberspace in our collective consciousness. However, for me, it's an interview that he gave in 2003 that reverberates in my head. He was being interviewed by The Economist about the future, and rather than simply offering a set of predictions about new and novel technologies, Gibson said this. The future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. I like to think he wasn't ducking the question per se, so much as offering a different way in. Gibson's provocation suggests that the future is not a destination or an event yet to transpire, but rather it is a collection of activities and encounters and even things that we could see if we would just so choose. In this way, the future is knowable, even observable in our present if we pay the right attention. Of course, long before Gibson gave that interview, in the very places that his work was most constantly referenced, yet another attitude to the future was on display. It was given voice by Alan Kay, an American computer scientist, at a Xerox Park event in 1971 with this maxim. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. This understanding of the future has an orientation to action. The future is not waiting to be imagined, discovered or avoided. It's being built in the present. This embodies a distinctive American cultural trait. The future is a project, most closely aligned to ideas about progress and technological advancement. In this way of thinking, the future is a promised land, and the present and the past are encumbrances that can be readily shed or erased. Notwithstanding the remarkable hubris encoded in Kay's utterance, and the daily consequences of that attitude we still manage today in our dealings with and through digital worlds, there is something about the act of making the future that feels generative. How should we be thinking about the future here in Australia in 2022? Perhaps you should take a page out of Gibson's book and take a moment to look around. And if we did, what pieces of the future might we find already here? And what would we do with that knowledge? I've been thinking about this question a lot recently. 
looking around and hoping to catch a glimpse of a future that might help us navigate the COVID-19 present and what comes after it. And it strikes me that one of the inescapable pieces of the future, already unevenly distributed in the present, is not a technology per se, or a behavior, or a demographic pattern. Rather, it is the inescapability of complicated systems as foundational aspects of our daily routines. Over the arc of the pandemic, we have seen systems as they failed in some way or another. We've acted together and communally to help keep those systems working. We've created new systems, purpose-built for the moment, and we've held our breaths collectively, hoping they might succeed. All the while, their interdependencies became clearer and clearer. So did the various fragilities and breakpoints. Where once we just saw the pieces and rarely wondered at the connections, now the whole is on display and we should not look away. Ordinarily, most systems remain invisible to the general public. Prior to the pandemic, for instance, most of us didn't spend a lot of time pondering global supply chains or the complex dance of delivery services or the interconnection of state and federal regulatory frameworks. But here in Australia over the last two years, we have seen many systems rendered in plain sight and implicated in our everyday lives. In part, the failure of these systems is what made them visible to the public. Systems that delivered food to our grocery stores, systems that delivered educational content to our children, systems that made sense of viral loads and population epidemiology, systems to obtain, certify, and distribute vaccines, systems that shut down our borders, systems that spread factual news, even the systems of electricity, telephony, and the internet. We saw these systems because they stopped working. For me, at least, this sudden knowledge of systems sits atop another knowledge that we gained during the bushfire season of 2019-2020. That season made unforgettably visible a different set of systems. Fire, water, rain, wind, smoke, firefighters and fire safety apps, and of course, climate and climate change. If this is a little bit of our future on display in the present, how should we make sense of it all? What can we say about the systems we have seen? As a category, not in their specifics. Well, first, systems are always and already a collection of things be they procedures, principles, or objects. Secondly, systems implicate people as well as technology. Third, systems are ever-present and important to daily life. Fourth, systems are frequently invisible and resist easy comprehension or legibility as they're often deeply complex and complicated. Fifth, systems can and do span geographic, cultural, political, and regulatory borders. Taken this way, it becomes easy to see that systems have been at the core of the work of the Australian public service for more than a century. Garen himself clearly understood the importance of systems and their functioning, from the Australian constitution to the public service itself. Indeed, government has both been a system and been responsible for building, regulating, administering, securing, and sometimes decommissioning all manner of systems. Of course, over the decades, The government has developed increasingly specialised functions and portfolios, even as the systems became increasingly dynamic, adaptive, open, interconnected, and built on and with sophisticated technologies. Furthermore, the pandemic has been a series of society-wide experiments in reconfiguring and adjusting systems, and in having to respond quickly to changing circumstances and in contradistinction to conventional wisdoms. There is much we should reflect on from this period. And as we look to a future rich with even more such systems, we might need to imagine new models of engagement and governance, new ways of critical thinking and critical doing, and new sorts of training. How do we teach ourselves to see systems all the time and not just when they're broken? And building on Kay's injunction, how would we approach thinking about systems, making sense of them, designing, building, securing, and stopping them again? How would we build future systems? What tools do we need? What skills? What conversations do we need to have and where would we have them? What would the role of government be in the creation, management, regulation and security of such systems? How do we need to train, organise and manage our workforces and our organisations? Where would the citizen, the community and the corporation fit into our thinking? Whilst it might not seem obvious, I think one of the places we might find answers is in the past. In a not dissimilar moment of upheaval and change, an approach to systems as building blocks of the future emerged. That approach was called cybernetics. 
As a form of systems thinking, cybernetics dates back to the 1940s and is strongly linked to the rise of computers. Now, for some of you, I suspect cybernetics is but a faintly familiar thing, a thing you think you know but cannot quite place. It's a familiar stranger or an echo of an earlier conversation. It starts in the aftermath of World War II, when the conversations were about what to do with all that computing power and data, and what this would mean for how the world could or should be. It was a time when governments, universities, and companies were all competing to take advantage of recent innovations. Everyone worried about the future, but also they wondered about it. Every month, it seemed, brought new technological breakthroughs. Things that had been theoretical were suddenly possible. Against this backdrop of febrile activity and in the lingering shadows of the destructive power unleashed during the war, cybernetics would articulate a whole new area of study and a whole new way of looking at the world. To develop a language and techniques that will enable us to indeed attack the problem of communication and control, brought about by the rise of new computational machines. For Norbert Wiener, one of the early founders of cybernetics, computers raised unique challenges. He wondered how he might understand these new technologies and communicate with and through them. Wiener drew his inspiration from the Greek word for helmsman, kybernetes, illustrating his belief that the science of cybernetics would be the science of steerage or control broadly defined. Cybernetics was Wiener's framework for mediating the relationship between people and the new machines, and for processing the technical and other kinds of knowledge this relationship would bring forth. For him, the notion of control was especially important given the rhetoric surrounding thinking machines and the ways that early computing had already been used by the military. For Wiener, the world would become a whole new kind of feedback loop of ecological, technical, and human systems. Cybernetics argued persuasively that one had to think about the relationship between humans, computing, and the biological as a holistic system. It wasn't just about a theory either, it was about actively building systems and thus building the future. Cybernetics may owe some of its intellectual roots to Wiener, but there are others in the conversation, including Claude Shannon, J.C.R. Licklider, John von Neumann, Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead, and Jerome Wisner. These names recall the earliest days of computing, information science, ecology, applied anthropology, and technological innovation as well as such organisations as Bell Labs, MIT, DARPA, the Institute for Advanced Studies, and the Vanegren and National Science Foundations. And that's just the American branch. Ultimately, there would be events all over the world, and through the years, to discuss and debate and iteratively evolve cybernetics in a myriad of different ways. I find myself interested in the ways that cybernetics remade itself and the things that it influenced and shaped. It was a point of view about the future and how to build it, never a prediction of what the future might be. It's quite possible to argue that artificial intelligence as a research agenda in the 1950s is a direct and immediate product of cybernetics. It was surely in dialogue with it, even as it sought to erase it. In the 1960s, DARPA was funding work that built on cybernetics and again pulled together many of the same players, or at least their intellectual descendants. That lineage brought us the internet, the space program, and contemporary robotics. And of course, there are other descendants and other echoes. For instance, cybernetics would travel with Gregory Bateson to California and to touch many of the founders of today's Silicon Valley. This next cybernetic wave would continue to engage with the future of computing and humanity, and it would increasingly focus attention on the broader ecological dimensions. Here it would find form with Stuart Brand and the Whole Earth Catalog, and also Douglas Engelbart and the internet and the personal computer, and of course, design thinking and Stanford University. And then there is the way that cybernetics travels through Gordon Pask and Jason Reichardt and MIT's Media Lab to shape design, computer graphics, and digital art. In fact, cybernetics has been an intellectual wellspring for the 20th century. Scratch the surface and somewhere there, there will be a link to cybernetics. It was more than just an approach to the future. It was an inspiration for a multiplicity of different futures and a toolkit to get you there. One of the key concepts in cybernetics that has persisted is the idea of feedback, where the output of a system is also its future input. This is a devastatingly simple insight. And whilst it predates cybernetics, it's a concept that found new audiences through cybernetics, 
as feedback grew especially important with the advent of computers and data as we know them today. Feedback was married with circular causality, which focused on reciprocal relationships between the ecological, the human, and technical pieces of a system. In a future rich with dynamic and adaptive systems, we will need to pay particular attention to feedback, feedback loops, and reciprocities, to the ways that they are constituted and constitutive. We'll need to see each system and its dynamics, not just its pieces, but the ways in which they are assembled and by whom. We will need to remember and be reminded that every system has a history and a set of reasons why it came to be that way. Knowing how to ask about the boundaries of a system, its interdependencies and affordances are critical skills, as is being able to determine who is erased or rendered mute or invisible in a system. Because of its proximity to World War II and the shared knowledge of how technology in general and computers in particular had been utilized, cybernetics was built on the idea that systems would require deliberate and concerted steerage, in Wiener's words. The debate inside the cybernetics community was very much about how to ensure that new systems didn't create further destruction. The debate would later expand to include a critique of automation and labor, universal basic income, and even capitalism. Put another way, cybernetics had a politic, which is to say it brought a distinctive point of view to the way it thought systems should be built. Our responsibility then is to ensure that as we contemplate future systems, we do so alive to the fact that they will embody a politic and conscious of the fact that we shape that self-same point of view. We should not adhere to the notion that technology is neutral and should instead encourage debate about the values in technology and the systems that would encompass them. This is as true for a regulatory framework managing electronic vehicle charging stations as it is for the next generation NBN network or even telehealth rebate schemes, among many, many other things. We will need to actively create spaces for such conversations and equip ourselves to have them. If cybernetics is a way of making sense of systems, and if those systems always and already include relationships between the human, technological, and ecological, then our understanding of future systems needs to be informed by those three things and the relationships between them. And cybernetics could indeed help us approach our system's rich future. As such, cybernetics offers a perspective that could inform a range of different practices and practitioners. Standing in 2021, the ideas of cybernetics, of steering a technological object, of humans in the loop, and of the environment, feels hopeful and a generative approach to the future. In this oration, I do not propose to lay out a detailed cybernetic systems approach for government, though I would like to extend an invitation for government to consider how such an approach could be useful and complementary to the practices already at work. What I can offer instead is a perspective on the attributes of organizations that build good and successful cybernetic systems, which is to say the characteristics of healthy, vibrant cybernetic organizations. When we launched a new school of cybernetics here at the Australian National University in January 2021, it felt like a tall order. This was the first new school created at the ANU in more than 30 years. It's also the first school of cybernetics in Australia and the first new school of cybernetics globally in two generations. And whilst much has been written about the theory of cybernetics, far less has been written about the organizations that do it well. So we've been finding our way. Our School of Cybernetics builds on the work of the Autonomy Agency and Assurance Innovation Institute inside the College of Engineering and Computer Science. I created the 3AI in September 2017 as an experimental space in which to establish a new branch of engineering to take AI safely, sustainably, and responsibly to scale. <laughs> Little did I know it would become a school quite so quickly. In building the 3AI and in launching the new school, we've learned a great deal about how to critically think and critically do cybernetics. We've also learned a great deal about doing cybernetics in this place, on Ngunnawal and Nambri land, informed by 60,000 years of indigenous ways of knowing, many of which are profoundly cybernetic. In steeping ourselves in the intellectual history of cybernetics and its practitioners, there have been things that seem especially relevant as we train our students to approach systems as building blocks of our future. In particular, there are three threads that have revealed themselves, and I want to share them with you. I tend to think of them as hallmarks of organizations that will build successful systems, cybernetic systems. So let me unpack them in turn. Number one, iterative communications. 
In the 1940s and 1950s, the conversations about cybernetics unfolded not in hours, but over days, weeks and years. Ideas were iterated. The line of inquiry wasn't always direct. In tackling the future of computing, participants discussed and debated the consciousness of octopuses and childhood development in Bali, as much as linguistics and the future of calculations. Ideas flowed, accumulated, and grew. In so doing, people build a body of distinctive and new knowledge, and they also build a community. I know it sometimes feels impossible, but there's reason to believe that we need to work on iteration, to allow the space in which the right answer isn't always the first one we happen upon. In the School of Cybernetics, we try to create a space for the arc of a conversation to change over time and evolve. It's about making sure we have room for ideas to accumulate, cross-propagate, and change form. Number two, productive discomfort. As a field, cybernetics fused maths, engineering, and philosophy with biology, psychology, and anthropology, among many others. The diversity of voices in any given room was startling. Participants in the conversation and debates came from all over the world, as well as all over the disciplinary map. They were at different points in their careers, and they had different lived experiences. It was robustly interdisciplinary before that term was in common currency. In the various accounts of the early days of cybernetics, all make mention of just how hard it was to find common ground and even a common vocabulary. They also make clear to mention, though, the ways in which those conversations were like nothing else any of them had or would again experience. As we look to a world rich in systems, we need to find a value in the diversity of voices for the productive discomforts that they can generate. Building on the idea of iterative communication and community, we also need to cultivate and recognize new kinds of leaders and new kinds of organizations. In the School of Cybernetics, we've worked hard to hold communities of diverse voices in generative conversation. It requires real work, considerable attention, and a capacity to tolerate dissonance and disagreement and to see them as sites of production. It will always be a work in progress. Number three, strength and grace. The last important lesson in the cybernetic canon is, for me at least, an unexpected one, and perhaps one that is only visible with considerable distance. One read of cybernetics is that it failed to frame the world along its preferred lines. Another read is that cybernetics has, in fact, shaped and shape-shifted through multiple generations and interpretations. Its impact might not have been straightforward, but its legacies are everywhere. What if the reason cybernetics persisted is because it was a framework, not a prescription? An approach, not a prediction. In a very early conversation about the work we needed to do at the ANU, one of my staff said, we should focus less on problem solving and more on question asking. These days, I think we would say we need to focus less on problem solving and more on the broad context. We should learn to ask better questions and to expect better answers from ourselves and others. In our work in the School of Cybernetics, we try to build approaches that we can share and that will be generative and propel others forward. We work to make the space for others to carry our work forward and to change it as they go. Our futures seem to require different models of leadership, critical thinking, and critical doing, and different kinds of training experiences than those currently at hand. We need to fill this gap. We need to help citizens and organizations approach future systems and to critically frame the role of government, industry, and civic and civil societies in the creation, management, regulation, and security of such systems. I know that much like the cybernetic conversations of the 1940s, we need as many voices and points of view as we can gather together. In the School of Cybernetics, I like to believe we're doing some of that work, and I hope others will join us. This is a moment for government to step in and step up. Cybernetics is an important approach to a system's full future, and it strikes me that there is an opportunity to reappraise and refit it for the world of 21st century dynamic, complex systems and the people who will regulate them. For the public service, this is an invitation and a challenge. Cybernetics is the articulation of a system with dynamic feedback loops that bring together humans, increasingly smart computing, and the broader ecological world. It's also an approach to building such complex systems that favors many voices, unfolding conversations, and the necessity to build new knowledge. And much like Garen himself understood more than a century ago, I believe that whatever we build will need to move, grow, and adapt. Our ideas will always end up in someone else's hands.
And when they do, we need to hope we gave them enough grace and enough shape to hold the future.